Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Baptist Church Collingwood. And it's good to see you all, and uh, we are blessed to be able to meet together again. And uh, those who join by way of the internet, welcome to. We begin by singing the hymn, Come Christians Join to Sing. six months of being closed. We also extend greetings to our American friends as they celebrate 4th of July. Uh, I don't think I need to read any more of the announcements that are on the bulletin. Uh, they're self-explanatory, but I know that Judith Ann has something she wants to share. Yeah. 
and offerings, and they could invite the ashes now to, to wait upon you. issues and individuals that we need to bring, bring to God. Uh, we're living in difficult days and I know that the extended lockdown has been difficult for many people. And uh, we're asked to remember to pray for Joyce Maxwell, uh, who has health issues, like Fortune and Donna Buller. And also remember others who we don't see very often, who never missed how Miller and uh, her husband Bob. And uh, others who are not able to join us, Blanche and Corporal uh, and Colin. Let's quietly where you are, bring your own prayers and then I will lead in a prayer. Let's pray. We come to you this morning, O oh God, and approach you with the name of Jesus, who is our Saviour. We come to you as our Father and know that you are present with us by your Holy Spirit. As we come, we bring our prayers to you. Lord, we thank you that you hear us and that you do answer our prayers. Help us to look for those answers and also to listen for what you are trying to tell us. Lord, we know that sometimes things are difficult. We pray especially for those who are struggling with health issues, for Joyce Maxwell, Doug Fortune and Donna Muller. 
and Lord for Bob and Carol. We just ask that they might each know your presence and know your healing touch. And for others who are not able to join us yet, Lord, we just commit them to you and ask your blessing. We come collectively as your people. You know us and you know exactly what we stand in need of. And you promise to supply all our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for every level of government. Decisions are made. Oh Lord, we pray that we might continue to enjoy the freedom that we do to worship. That the, we might return to normal soon. Lord, we, we thank you for all that you're doing among us and through us. And so we pray that you will help us to see what you have for us. As a church, may we be a witness for you where we are. Lord, not just in the building, but wherever we find ourselves. Help us to be a witness for you. So again, we thank you for your love and your faithfulness to us, for all that you provide for us. We pray for those who are in difficult situations throughout this world, who are serving you and sharing the good news. Some being in prison because of their faith. Lord, draw near to them and bring encouragement. We ask, Lord, that we might recognize that we are part of a church that is worldwide, made up of people from all nations, and help us to acknowledge that. And so continue to be with us and encourage us this morning as we share together. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Saviour, who taught us when to pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. My reading is quite a long one. It's from Second Corinthians, of chapter eleven. And uh, I'm going to read from the New International Version. The Apostle Paul says, I hope you'll put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I may present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind some, may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. I do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way, and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the region of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. I'll keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. But such people are false apostles deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. I repeat, let no one take me for a fool. 
But if you do, then tolerate me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. In this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You can gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you, or exploits you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have laboured and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor and the king Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. I must go on boasting. And then he, he goes on to say, just at the end of the, in the next chapter, uh, in Verse 6, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain. No one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassing great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly by my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. May God bless that reading of his word to us. He was saying it took a miracle.
The title of the message is Paul's Message, and uh, Paul Dunledge mentioned, I hope I'm not going to relate one of his examples. But <laughs> I've been thinking about the way in which we as, as believers are living these days, and the circumstances under which we live. We have been under, um, well, stay-at-home order for much longer than I like to think about. And now we have the freedom and we are able to meet together and worship together and the vaccines are, are being uh, given and uh, many already have had the two vaccines. And so it appears that things are opening up. But not just that. We're living in a day where, where we, have, we are faced with a pandemic, COVID, but also people in uh, BC at the moment are experiencing really high temperatures. And we're living in days when uh, we are being blamed ourselves or blaming ourselves for the change in the, the climate. I've gone back through the years and, and recognized the different fears that have been going on for the last 50 years at least. And uh, it's gone from thinking that we're going to have an ice age to this moment of time when we are, things are heating up. Of course, what I see happening as well is that uh, Children in schools are being educated, or are they? They're not in school at the moment. Many are not in school and are just having uh, virtual classes. And what things are being taught in schools? We're being told about the awful things that happened in the residential schools and how things, lots of questions surround that. So we're living in days when there is much to be concerned about. Where many people think that they have control over um, the universe. In many ways, it appears that many people think that they can do as they please. Paul, as he's writing to the Corinthian church, we have to understand a little about the Corinthian, what it was like in Corinth at that time. Corinth is between the Greek mainland and the southwest corner of Greece. And it is there, it was a kind of major place of passing through, people would pass through trading and so on, it, uh, it was a lively trading place. Uh, ships often preferred to sail into Corinth and transport their goods over land across in, into Greece rather than through along further on the coast. Corinth's history can be divided into, into different classes, but the fact was that in Corinth there was a lot of sexual immorality, a lot of things that were taking place that were destroying people's lives. It was a, a place of prosperity at the time of Paul. It was a, a mixed cosmopolitan populace. Many uh, religious shrines, and many that go there today can see some of those shrines that are still present, what exists, what is left. Corinth was home to a famous temple to Aphrodite that supposedly employed a thousand temple prostitutes. Also temples to other Greek gods, such as Poseidon, the god of the sea. Demeter and poor goddesses of an ancient Greek fertility cult. So 
life in, in Corinth was certainly mixed. And Paul, as he's writing to the Corinthian church, he's in prison as he's writing this letter. And he's crying out to these people. He came to minister in, in Corinth. And that during his ministry there, he was, he didn't charge them for the work that he did. We read in Acts chapter 18, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who recently came from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Here's Paul's example. This is what he was doing whilst in Corinth. He wasn't wanting to get the church to support him. Instead, he was working. But every Sabbath he was there in the synagogue. There he was, teaching and preaching about Jesus. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. You see, they brought some money for him so that he could continue to do that work and, and share the good news of Jesus. That Jesus had come to be saviour of sinners and that Jesus had came, had come into the world to give us new life. And so here he became, devoted himself entirely to the preaching. Testified the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, and when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own hands, I am innocent of it. From now on I'll go to the Gentiles. So the message was to go first of all to the Jew, but then to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius, uh, Justus, a worshipper of God, Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack or harm you, because I have many people in the city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So here is Paul continuing that work. Although there was opposition, he didn't let that stop him. He continued to preach. And he heard from God, don't be afraid, continue on. Despite all that is taking place around. And then in verse 12 of Acts 18, it says, While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man they charged as persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I'll not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul, and Galio showed no concern whether Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, then he left and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. So Paul was dedicated to preaching, to sharing the good news about Jesus, and he was concerned that they had heard the message. They had left their own lives, they had come into a place of walking with God. And here he feels, as he's writing the letter, that they suddenly are listening to some other people who are teaching other things, who are saying certain things are okay when they're not. And so Paul is concerned for them and has a burden for them and wants them to be pure. He wants them to be totally committed to Christ. 
He doesn't want half-hearted believers. He wanted them to be completely, completely dedicated. And here he talks about the super apostles, those who uh, came and they, they taught what they wanted to teach and, and they expected to receive, they expected more. And he describes them as serving someone else. Here is Paul as he burdens his heart, as he opens his heart to these people, he does something that he finds difficult because in, in another place he said, God forbid that I should glory save in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here he is boasting. He is sharing about his life, what he has done, where he is at this moment in time. The things that he has experienced in order to help them to realize the difference between what is fake and what is real. To understand that there are many who will deceive. We will find out today that there are many who will deceive and want to say that everything is okay, that we can do as we please without consequences when the reality is that God is a holy God. He looks at us and he knows what we need and we know that we need forgiveness. We all know that we need to come to the foot of the cross and recognize that Jesus died on the cross for us and receive forgiveness. And then experience that new life as he fills us with his spirit and we live a new life. We are born again of the Spirit. Then we walk in the Spirit. Then we put to death that old life, that old way of doing things. And Paul tries to share with his people, with the people in Corinth who have been deceived, that Holding on to the truth sometimes means suffering. That holding on to the truth and sharing the gospel sometimes means opposition. Paul, as he, he writes in different places, he gives us a, a clue as to the way in which he conducts himself. We can go back to this, what he had to say in a moment. But one of the things he said when he, he wrote to the Philippian church, remember he was put in prison in Philippi. He and Silas were thrown into the innermost prison and their feet put in stocks because they were preaching the good news about Jesus and forgiveness. And we know that although he had been beaten, although both had been beaten and they were in the dark, yet... There was something amazing that took place because what they were doing was praising God. And as they were praising God, there was an earthquake and we know the prison doors were thrown open. And as later on, as he writes to the church that was formed there after his release from prison, after the jailer came to faith and others came to faith as a result of his ministry, nothing could stop the advance of the gospel. Paul says this, this in uh, Philippians chapter 1. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. Let latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So here is Paul's 
sharing what was important to him, it was his love for Christ. His appreciation for the knowledge of his forgiveness. The knowledge of the presence of Christ by his Spirit. And he goes on to say, for to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So here Paul gives an example of his thinking. His thinking that he, he has to preach the gospel, whatever it costs. He knows that if it means death, then he is with Christ, which is far better. But he says it's more necessary for me to suffer the hardships that I'm suffering in order that you might hear the gospel, in order that you might find the truth of God's love and his faithfulness. Paul, an example of one who perseveres. He doesn't give up. And as a result of that, he has such a power behind him because he knows he heard the words of to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul didn't claim anything of himself, but he claimed all that he shared was from Christ, from his love for him, from one who was persecuting the church, one who had such uh, an encounter on that Damascus road that turned his life around completely, that he left those old things behind and continued on. But that meant suffering. Look at what he says here. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He's an Israelite. The Jews were trying to criticize him, but he had those qualifications. Are they servants of Christ? So am I. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. You see, sometimes it costs to speak for Christ. As a teenager, I was invited to a special Sunday afternoon session with uh, Pastor Richard Vermbrand. Pastor Vermbrand uh, was a believer who had suffered under communism and been imprisoned because of his faith. And uh, he had been tortured, he had gone through so much. And as a group of young people, we were eager to hear how did he cope with the imprisonment? How did he cope with the suffering? He didn't give up, he was imprisoned numerous occasions, but he continued, he was faithful to God and knew Jesus to be his saviour. I remember him sharing the way in which he was thankful that he had memorised scripture and certain scriptures had been of help to him because he didn't have access to scripture when he was in prison. But he knew God's presence with him through that time. And he looked at us and he, he, he said that we experienced a total freedom to share the good news. But he felt that many in the church were silent, were not prepared to, to acknowledge they knew Jesus to be sa their saviour. And wanted to be secret disciples. He challenged us. Because of his, the way that he had met with God in that prison cell, he, he also saw certain 
things that hurt him in our culture. And one of the things that stays with me, remains with me, is the way in which he felt that the worship of God was slovenly. I don't know whether you understand that word. But was half-hearted. And he said it hurt him when he saw young men praying with their hands in their pockets and just talking to God and not realizing that they are meeting with the Holy God. And that is something that we, we, we shouldn't just take for granted. It's something that we should recognize as being special. We have access to Almighty God. We are able to call Him our Father because of Jesus. And I remember He, he really did challenge us on that occasion. And it remained with me. And now there's an organization that has been set up that He, uh, through His ministry, which is called Tortured for Christ, which supports Christians who are being persecuted around the world. Knowing Christ, knowing the cost. The question we had for ourselves was, am I prepared to pay the cost? You see, in these days, we're expected to go along with the crowd. And if that was happening, the Corinthian church would not have existed, but they had gone against the crowd. They had left the crowd and come to acknowledge Jesus as their Savior. They had put the old life behind them. They had a new life to lead. To lead their lives with Christ. Not to follow the crowd, but to be Markers to be people who will share love, who will know the presence of God. You see, it wasn't Pastor Wurmbrand that survived. He survived because of God's presence with him, because of the strength that he was given to face what he endured during that time. And many people who have been persecuted for their faith will say the same thing. That they have known the presence of God and had the strength to stand on the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's difficult because sometimes we go against the trends. Sometimes we go against what the world has to offer. And so we should. The Apostle Paul shares all those experience he had. But the fact was that he knew the presence of God with him. He knew what it was to face very real, severe persecution. And yet he counted it an honor to suffer for Christ. Listen to what he says earlier on in this letter. He says, For Christ's love compels us. We are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Listen to that. Just put that in the context of where we are today. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Do you see that? Do you hear that? No longer live for themselves. 
Paul didn't live for himself, he lived for Christ. He lived to share and encourage the believers, to help them to know the difference that Christ had made. And so he says, no longer consider, regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if any was in, in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He urges them to be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. That's exactly what the early uh, disciples, after Jesus had ascended and the Holy Spirit had come at Pentecost, that's what they did. They continued to witness whatever the cost. They were totally devoted to Christ. The question I have for each of us is, are we prepared to stand? Or do we feel we need to compromise? The deceiver wants us to compromise the gospel. The gospel is clear. He saves us. He gives us new life. He gives us the ability to love even those who may be difficult to love. We have a message to declare. Whatever the cost. Whatever the cost. Paul paid the price on so many occasions for his ministry. God says to you and to me, my grace is sufficient for you. May we be true to his word. May we be prepared sometimes to stand against the majority who want us to go the way of the world instead. We need to recognize that it is God who is ultimately in control. People say the universe is in control, but it's God who created the universe. It sang that him. It took a miracle to put the world in space. You know, the miracle of existence on this world, it's God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We know God loves us, God loves each and every one who lives on this earth. The scripture tells us he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The message is clear. He loves us. He wants us to experience his forgiveness, to experience a new life that he gives, to change from the old way, to experience a new way. Many today are trying to say there is a new way that is open. It's a false way. May God help us to discern the truth of the gospel. Be like Paul, be prepared, whatever the cost. For to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. That's a verse that has remained with me and stuck with me so much so that I remembered it in Welsh. Abiwi me, you priest, Amaru, see them. May God help us to say that. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Amen. 
We sing our final hymn. It is well with my soul. shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever.